Well, good evening. Good evening, good evening. This is Harry Brown, and this is Saturday evening, July 31st, 2004, and I'm so glad you decided to tune in tonight. I know you aren't just too lazy to change the dial, so I appreciate the fact, as you know, you have many choices in radio, and you have chosen this program, so I appreciate it. Well, what's going on? Well, a week or so ago, the Television Critics Association gave their awards for the best shows of the year. This is like the Emmy Awards, only it's the Television Critics Association that does the voting rather than people in the television industry itself. And there were the usual awards for the best comic, the best comedy show, the best dramatic show, and so on. And, of course, there is an award for the best news show. Best news and information show, in fact, is the category. And guess who won the award from the Television Critics Association for the best news and information show? The answer is Comedy Central's The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, a fake news comedy show. And it's very interesting that last Sunday on one of those Sunday afternoon media shows where four people on CNN or Fox News sit around and talk about how the media is covering the stories in the news, this came up on that show, the one on Fox News, and one of the panelists on that show said, I believe this award was deserved. The comedy show, or the daily show with Jon Stewart, was the only show that showed any skepticism whatsoever before the war in Iraq started. It is the only show that actually challenges what the people are saying in politics. It is the only show that points out the contradictions in what they say, and the hypocrisies in what they say. It is the only show that does not take seriously what the politicians say. It is the only show that actually challenges them. And I thought that was very interesting that this was recognized by a conservative of all people. But I would agree that it is the best source of news. There have been so many instances on that show where they have called my attention to things that I did not know and sent me immediately to my computer to check on the Internet and get all the details of something that I never would have heard on Fox News or CNN or on the evening news on ABC, CBS, or What's that other one? NBC? Well, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the free market for a moment. You know, the free market really is a wondrous thing. Uh, just as an example, you go into a supermarket, and you have thousands, actually thousands of products to choose from, various kinds of meats, uh, all kinds of vegetables, packaged foods, condiments, and much, much more. And for each item, there are several competing brands from which you can choose. You want uh, ice cream, for instance. There's Dryers, uh, Edie's, Ben & Jerry's. Hagen dazs and probably several others in any store that you go into. It doesn't matter what other customers want. You can choose what you want. It isn't just one brand of ice cream, take it or leave it. You also can go into the store with a shopping list of just the items that you want, or you can browse and pick out new items to try. And any product you find that you don't like, you just simply avoid in the future. Nobody forces it on you. And if there's something about the supermarket itself that you don't like, uh, poor selection, prices too high, poor service, uh, an inconvenient location, you can go to a different store entirely. You decide. Supermarkets present what I think is truly an amazing array of good things you can choose from. In fact, in our family, I do the shopping because I love supermarkets. I love to shop for food. I love to look for new foods to uh, bring home and have for dinner. But the kind of choice that you get there is the same in department stores, uh, clothing stores, electronic stores, video stores, car dealers, and many, many other kinds of stores. There's only one kind of product that I can think of offhand that isn't attractive in this way. And what's that? It's your children's schooling. For some strange reason in America, and in fact in almost every part of the world, schooling doesn't operate in the same free market where you find food, clothes, electronics, cars, and other products. Schools are operated mostly by the government, and the result is completely different from that wondrous array of choices that are available to us in other areas. The government takes the money from us by force through taxes, and then the politicians and bureaucrats decide what kind of a school will be inflicted on your child. You have no choice at all. Oh, I know. You can attend Board of Education meetings and try to get them to change their policies, or you can elect better people to the Board of Education or the superintendent of schools or to Congress, which is now increasingly controlling local schools. But all of that is very, very difficult. Nobody asks you to do that with regard to products in the supermarket or in department stores. You don't have to do that to get the kind of ice cream you like. And even if you did go to all the trouble to change the way your child's school operates, you might then be depriving your neighbor of the kind of school he wants. It's all or nothing. And that's why there are such fierce battles about schooling. It's because whoever wins gets to inflict his way, not just on his own children, but on everybody's children. So here we have a situation where the government takes the money from you, whether or not you want to pay it, whether or not you have children, and you pay for the schools through property taxes, mostly. 
If you own your own home, you pay directly in property taxes, but even if you're renting, you pay a higher rent because your landlord has to pay the property tax. You also pay for the schools through uh, sales taxes and state and federal income taxes. And it gets more and more expensive every single year. You know, 25 years ago, the government schools in America cost less than $2,000 per child per year. That's as recently as 1979. Now they cost over $7,000 per child per year, even allowing for inflation. That's an enormous increase in cost from under 2000 to over 7000 What if the government didn't operate the schools? What if all the schools were in the same free market where we find so many good foods and other products? What would it be like? Well, I can't help but believe that it would be a heck of a lot better. But is it realistic to think that a private free market in education would work? Of course it is. All our experience with free market products tells us that we should expect much more freedom of choice, much lower costs, much better service, much improvement from year to year when we get government out of the business of teaching our children. Look at the computer industry, which I've mentioned so often. It's the province of profit-seeking businessmen who must continually find new ways to please you by doing more with less. If they don't, they lose their money and they go out of business. And so computers become less expensive year after year, even as they become more and more useful. Today, any unit of computer power costs less than 1%, less than 1% of what it cost 25 years ago. But the cost of each child in a government school is over three times as much as it was 25 years ago. Not only are computers far less expensive, they're so much more efficient, easier to use, and fun to work with than they were 25 years ago. But schools have become less efficient, less safe, and less satisfying for the parents whose children are stuck in those schools. Unlike computer companies, government schools are non-competitive monopoly organizations backed up by all the force of government. School vouchers that so many people are pushing for will not make government schools more competitive for one simple reason. Government schools don't have to compete. No matter how many students they might lose to private schools or homeschooling, government schools still get their money by force. And politicians use the worst failures of schools as an excuse to demand even more from us. I don't know any other way to put it. You repeal the government schools, abolish the government schools, get rid of the government schools, and let people get education in the free market the way that we get everything else that is of value to us. You know, the government schools just started in the middle of the 1800s. Before that, people had much the kind of good education that we would hope for people getting from schools today, but they got it privately. That school marm in the little town in the movie that you see of the Old West or whatever is usually somebody who is financed privately by the parents paying to bring a school marm to town and, and conduct a one-room schoolhouse. And anybody who wanted to uh, get an education got one. And there was a high rate of literacy before there were government schools, even though we didn't have all the communications uh, facilities and opportunities that we have today. James Fenimore Cooper's book, The Last of the Mohicans, and I don't have this information right in front of me, so I can't give you an exact figure, but I know that that book sold in the millions of copies in a country in which there were only about 50 million people at the time. That's how many people wanted to read that book and had the facility uh, to do so, of course. And if if you know that the book sold three or four million copies, then obviously there had to be tens of millions of people who could read of whom three or four million wanted to get that particular book. And, of course, once government took over, then the schools began to deteriorate. And they deteriorated very slowly at first, but in the 1960s that picked up tremendously when the federal government moved in. When I was a lad, I went to government schools, elementary and high school, and I was able to learn to read well. I, was, uh, I learned a great deal about geography and history, and I was a very poor student, but just by showing up in class, I soaked up a great amount of knowledge about math and somewhat about science. I never was very good in science, at least in those days, and I learned a great deal. And the only thing that was wrong, really, at least that seems to be wrong in retrospect, was that in addition to all of the academic learning, I learned a tremendous amount of things that I had to unlearn later, things about the social sciences, things like the government is the fair and impartial arbiter that keeps private business in line because private businessmen would succeed by cheating people if it weren't for the government. I learned that government actually delivers on whatever it promises to do. I learned that the U.S. government liberated Europe and Asia in World War II, even though it left half of Europe in the hands of the communists in actuality, and it left China in the hands of the communists also. I learned that Franklin Roosevelt used big government to save America from the Great Depression. And I also learned that without the government to take care of the poor we and, and do other things, we'd probably all die young from sickness. We wouldn't know how to read or write, and people would die from starvation in the streets, and on and on and on. And probably more than anything else, I learned that the U.S. government is America, that it's our patriotic duty to support whatever crazy policies the government decides to embark on. 
And I also learned that the United Nations was the great hope for peace. Well, it took me a few years after I got out of high school to unlearn all that. But I also retained all of the good academic learning that I had. And, of course, all of that has dwindled over the years, and now it, it, you have these situations where students entering college can't even read the entrance exam well enough to be able to take the exam, and yet they are able to graduate from high school. And, of course, the politicians themselves tell us how bad the schools are. Every year they tell us about infrastructure that's, that's uh, falling down, about how unsafe the schools are, about children who are not reading at the proper grade level, and so on. And, of course, they all have solutions for this, and most of those solutions do get put into place eventually, like Bush's No Child Left Behind or Kennedy's Head Start or all of these different programs, and yet still they come back next year or the year after saying, oh, the schools are falling down, they're not safe, the children aren't reading at grade level, and so on and so forth. So all of these things that we spent the money on haven't worked at all. Nothing works when the government operates it. What we want is an education system that gets better and better every year, not worse and worse every year, one that gets less expensive every year, one that excites children so that they'll want to learn on their own rather than treating school as prison, which is exactly the way I looked at it when I went to school for 13 years. Kindergarten plus 12 years. Don't get the wrong idea. Let us now go to the telephones, and we'll start with James in Alaska. Good evening, James. Oh, Harry, how are you doing? I'm just fine. What's up? Oh, hey, I'm, uh, we're, I'm stuck in Alaska, quote, unquote. So we're, uh, <laughs> help, we're, help we're, I'm stuck in Alaska. Yeah, well, uh, our Constitution says that the state is responsible for education, and I don't know how that ever came about. Since, oh, it's uh, in the state Constitution? Is yeah. That what you, yeah, I think it is in most uh, states of the country have something like that in the Constitution, well, that everyone the, everyone has a right to education. Yeah, well, every, uh, except for the first 13, I think they, uh, uh, they kind of base theirs on what the federal Constitution was. Huh? Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, I've got a question for you. Um, have you. How's your TV show coming? Oh, well, it, there really is no news. We're just in the process of uh, getting it ready that we're going to shoot the pilot at the end of August. Yeah. So until then, we will not be a step further along than we are now. But after that, then we will be trying to sell it to a network. Okay. So I might have some news maybe in September or something. But until then, it's just slogging along, getting the best script that we can. I see. Um, another question. Uh, I remember you talking about the Fed a couple of weeks ago on the archives, though. Did you ever read a book by G. Edward Griffin called The Creature from Jekyll Island? I have never read the book. I happen to know or did know Ed Griffin years and years and years ago, and I won't even say how many years because uh, it's so long ago. But uh, he was a very intelligent fellow, and I liked him very much when I knew him in Southern California. I have not read the book because I haven't felt any need to do so. The idea that this whole Federal Reserve System was a secret conspiracy foisted on the American people by the bankers is really kind of ho-hum to me. I mean, what, what, that's the way I felt about it, too. But, uh, man, when you start reading that book, I finally buckled down and decided to take a look at it. And, uh, I mean, he, everything he says makes sense. I mean, it's, it's all the money, you know. Um, and sure, but, but you could say the same thing about farm subsidies, that some secret conspiracy of a group of the big farm companies like uh, Archer Daniels Midland or somebody else of, of its time well, it's all uh, part of the same thing. Foisted, all, foisted the farm program on us. Uh, it's all part of the same thing is what I'm feeling. I mean, sure, sure. Right, what, what the, the, and the thing is that you have a government that is receptive to people that come along and want special privileges, and it just goes hand in hand with the congressmen who want to get reelected. And so you have a banking cartel in effect, you have a farm cartel in effect, and you have a, a medical cartel a pharmaceutical company cartel, and, and they all get their way. The, the regulatory agencies like the Interstate Commerce Commission and the Federal Trade Commission uh, were started by big business because they didn't like the competition they were getting, and they figured that if the government set the rules, the rules could be set in such a way that only the big companies could adhere to them and the others would not be able to compete with them. Everybody would fall in the line. Yeah, well, it's the same thing now with Bush's Medicare program and, and, and the FDA. They both are designed to uh, have qualifications for drugs and so on that only the biggest companies can meet because of the costs involved. So the big companies are all in favor of this kind of regulation because it helps to keep out the little guys who, who might compete with them. And it was the same thing with the banks. The banks uh, decided to, to get their share of the pie by setting up the federal reserve system. So, but the fact that it affects so many people, I mean, I, I mean, it's our economy for crying out loud. Sure, know? sure. But you see, that's that's not a question of how did it come about. That's a question of what what is it doing. And where we should focus our attention is on the damage the federal reserve system does, not how it was created in the first place, not who secretly wanted it to happen, because it doesn't really matter whether the secret conspiracy story is true or false, we're still stuck with the Federal Reserve System, and what we have to do is to get rid of the Federal Reserve System, and we're, not going to get, and we're not going to get rid of it by telling people it was all a secret conspiracy. We're going to get rid of it by showing them how much better off they would be uh, with sound money rather than fiat money created by the Federal Reserve System. So how are we going to do that? <laughs> well, uh, basically, keep plugging away. Uh, keep keep talking in terms of the benefits to individuals. Like in this, uh, my opening discussion. Well, yeah, that's, that's just old talk now. Come on, we need to we need some action plans here. Well, first of all, you've got to know what 
the, these action plans are going to be promoting. Uh, you notice in the, my introductory remark, remarks talking about the schools, I wasn't talking about a conspiracy of the National Education Association or anybody else. I was talking about how much better it would be for your children if we didn't have government schools. So that's what, what I'm saying is this is the approach we should take, and then we should work through any avenue that appears to be good. In your own way, you can write letters to the editor. You can uh, get on talk. Uh, you can get on forums and blogs and places like that on the Internet. You can call into talk shows like this one, but especially shows where there aren't so many compatible people and uh, bring up these things, whether it's about uh, fiat money or about the government schools or about uh, health care and how much better it would be if we got the government out of it and so on, and talk to people in terms of benefits. And then, of course, it goes without saying that you should never support with money or your vote anyone who is making government bigger. Uh, only support those people who you know, if they got elected, would definitely cut government and not give you any excuses about, well, we have to do this and that first, and no, maybe that someday was, we'll get to it. That leaves out the, the corporate party of Bush and, and uh, Cap Carey then, huh? It leaves them both out, yes. No, no <laughs> okay. question about it. Well, I'd really like to hear your, uh, see, uh, have you read that book and, and kind of give us a book report on it, you know? I mean, I think it would be uh, uh, beneficial for yourself uh, to, you know, because if you know how it's how it was put together, it might be better, easier to uh, help take it apart. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have no comment. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, all we have to do to take it apart is to repeal the Federal Reserve Act. Yeah, right, and, that's going to happen. How about just uh, start using uh, gold and silver on your own? Well, uh, you can do that, but you've got to be sure to do it in a way that you aren't making yourself vulnerable. Oh. But uh, realize, too, that there are certain issues that are not controversial and yet are very revolutionary. The idea, for example, of getting government out of schooling seems revolutionary, but realize that there aren't a lot of people in this country outside of officials of the teachers' union and the Department of Education who have a vested interest in keeping the schools in government's hands. It's not Government schools are not a Republican program or a Democratic program, so there's no party loyalty involved, it's and, it's and people can program. have... Well, but people can have an open mind about it because their party hasn't told them that this is how you should think on it. The same thing is true with regard to fiat money. There is no Republican or Democratic position on this that says we must have the Federal Reserve System. So when you start talking to a Republican or a Democrat about how much better it could be, how much uh, we could get rid of inflation and how much we could get rid of the business cycle and how, how much uh, better the economy would be without the Federal Reserve System, you're not up against a party platform that says, oh, no, 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 this is our party's program and we're going to stand up for it no matter how bad it is. Well, I thought the teachers were mostly like Democratic voters, you know. Uh, they're, they're candidates that uh, seem like they would be. They might be, but the idea of government schools is not a democratic program. Right. The idea of always spending more money on the schools is a democratic program, but it's also a Republican program. Well, I mean, I mean, the, how, do you, the, how do you feel about the, the fact that the schools have effectively dumbed down America so much that it's not nobody, a nobody takes seriously any of the, uh, uh, the, like the Federal Reserve or any of this stuff? I mean, people don't have the seeming capacity nor interest in why should learning they, anything about Why it. should they have an interest? Because the only time they hear about it is when somebody is complaining and saying there's a conspiracy, and you should know about this. Well, it's the last thing I want to know about. It's some terrible thing. It's like finding out there's a new disease that I didn't know about. But if you talk to me in terms of, boy, how much better your life could be if we repealed the income tax, or you didn't have to put money into Social Security, or if your children could go to schools that were far less expensive than the government schools and learn far more and other benefits, then people will take notice even if they don't believe that what you're advocating has a chance of coming about, simply, however, simply however, because it's so beneficial. However, what, don't you think that there's a uh, natural, why then turkeys, you know, if you, if you explain or, or, or show that this was done maliciously, people would be more inclined to say, well, that's not right. They screwed us. Basically. No, no. The reason that doesn't work, and I'm sorry to contradict you, but the reason it doesn't work is because by making this claim, you are asking people to take a stand on that question. Okay. And, that would, and that would involve a great deal of research on their part in order to know whether your claim is accurate. And uh, they don't want to do that. And I understand they don't want to do that, and I appreciate that they don't want to do it. So the question is, uh, would your life be far, far better if we did this thing, whatever it is, get rid of the income tax, get rid of government schools, whatever. And this is a conception thing, which doesn't require a lot of facts that have to be verified, but simply, uh, as in the case of the schools, as I said, look around, look how much better the supermarkets work than the schools, look how much better the computer industry is than the schools, and so forth, and people can understand that. Not all of them will agree with you. Not all of them will grasp it. Not all of them will be able to visualize it, but I would think a vast majority will, and you might be surprised tomorrow or Monday at work, just uh, bring this up. You know, I heard this crazy thing Saturday night on, on the radio. This guy was saying that our children would be so much better off if government got out of schooling entirely, and here are a couple of the points that he made. What do you think about this? Right. And just, just see what kind of a reaction you get. And if you've got a bad reaction to begin with, just bring up a couple of more of the points. And I think what you'll find is that people may agree or may not agree, but they will not have a vested emotional interest in disagreeing. They will not put up a wall immediately the way they will if you say that Bush should get the troops out of Iraq. Uh, they've already taken a stand on that one way or the other. And if the stand is that Bush was right about Iraq, nothing you say is going to change their minds. 
But when you talk about the schools, you're, you've got fertile ground because nobody has given them any instructions on how they're supposed to believe about that. Yeah, but, but then they don't have any vested um, interest in really pursuing it either. Well, they do if they have children. Yeah, most of the people I know have their kids are you know beyond that point. So. Well, they have grandchildren then. Uh-huh. So thanks so much for calling, James. We'll right. uh, uh, look forward to hearing from you when we're on the other network. And uh, good luck to you uh, when you talk to people about government schools on Monday. Uh, I should also mention that on the other network, uh, starting next weekend, I will also have a Sunday one-hour show on money, the economy, investing, and so on, uh, things that you can do with your savings to make them safer and to make sure that they're always there for you. And it will deal not with forecasting the progress or prospects for specific stocks or investments and so on, but more the strategies to take to make sure that you don't get yourself into trouble. To those who are waiting, I apologize for spending so much time with James, but he was raising some points that I think are very important to deal with. People are not going to respond when you talk to them about problems they didn't know existed. What they want to know is how to get rid of the problems they've been coping with in their own lives, about the difficulties with their children's schooling, about not having enough money, about their retirement, and these other things. And so what we want to talk to people about are the things that will make their life better, getting rid of the income tax, getting rid of the government schools, getting rid of Social Security so that that money is available for a secure retirement, ending the state of siege that America is in by changing American foreign policy to the traditional or allegedly traditional uh, policy of going it alone and staying out of other people's affairs around the world. And uh, so I did want to get into that and stick with it because it has to do with how we should be approaching other people, and that's a very, very important part of it. But now, enough of me talking. Let's go to Jonathan in Washington, D.C. Good evening, Jonathan. Good evening, Harry. Uh, wow, I guess uh, James's 15 minutes uh, gives me like three here. but uh... I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, you got four. Okay. Uh, well, first, I just want to say how glad I am that uh, you're moving to an earlier time slot next week because this is a little embarrassing because you're almost three times as old as I am, but you definitely have more energy at 1 o'clock in the morning than I do. <laughs> I always have, uh, even since when I was a little boy, so, yeah. so don't feel uh, embarrassed about that. Well, uh, I, will, I want to say something about The Daily Show uh, first, what you said in the first segment. I, I like The Daily Show a lot. I think Jon Stewart is hilarious. Um, but I also want to say that it is obvious, obviously to me a, a left-wing show. Yes, it does uh, skewer politicians that left-wing, right-wing, whatever, but if you notice, it doesn't really skewer left-wing policies. It skewers personalities, President Clinton and, and John Kerry certainly and other people like that, but it does it, it, all the time I see it skewering act, uh, conservative policies. Um, and I think that if John Stewart uh, were ever to discuss uh, getting the government completely out of education or repealing all gun control laws, they would probably make fun of that a lot too. Sure, so, uh, but understand that just by skewering politicians left and right and center, mm-hmm. what they are doing is laying the groundwork for us so that when we come along we can say, well, why in the world would you want these people to be managing your health care, uh, deciding what kind of standards should exist in your child's schools, you know, all of these things. Uh, they're, not, they're, not making, they're not closing the sale, but they are softening up the prospects in a way that is very, very valuable and, and, of course, as you know, unique on television. And so they are making our job easier. They're just not doing our job completely for us. Absolutely. And I think uh, I just wanted to, to point out that I don't think there's a, any single news source that is completely unbiased. It doesn't exist. No, uh, you're always coming from one, some perspective. Uh, it's only whether you're, you're more – some outlets are more – and honest about it than others. Well, as um, long as you accept the premise that government is terrible, evil, dumb, stupid, then I'm unbiased. <laughs> uh, before I, before we hit the break, one last comment about something James said. Sure. He said that um, uh, you know these are all words, and we need action. And I just whenever I hear someone say that, whenever I hear libertarians say that, I just want to say to them, uh, what have you done personally to bring people into the libertarian fold? Uh, I don't want to personally attack anyone, but the point is that. We nothing is going to change significantly until we have a much bigger movement overall. Sure. And that means persuading people. It means making ourselves articulate spokespeople for libertarian ideas. And that's why I think your persuasion seminars and your new book, Liberty A to Z, are so valuable. And the point is that you have to do the work yourself and talk to people if you want to you know, uh, take action on these things and stop focusing on whether the income tax was actually ratified properly or whether sure. George Bush was engineered the September 11th attack. Yeah, very, very good points, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. And I hope you will uh, call in when we have the new show next week. And it will be two hours earlier in whatever time zone you are. So uh, check my website next week for the details. This is Harry Brown. We'll be back right after the news. Our first caller is Richard in California. Good evening, Richard. Good evening, Harry. How are you tonight? I'm just fine. What's on your mind? Well, you, the guy, one of the previous callers asked what you do about a problem. You say you just keep plugging away. And my question is, why do you care? I mean, you personally have enough intelligence and, I assume, resources to live a life of freedom pretty much the way you choose. And I've read your web blogs when you were a presidential candidate and the incredible amount of traveling and the, what you put up with. And, and I'm interested <laughs> in why you care, why you keep plugging away. 
Well, for one thing, it's exciting. And for another, I consider it a real challenge. And I also plan to live another 30 years or more. And it isn't going to stay the way it is now unless we do something about it. It's going to continually get worse. And I wrote a book in 1973 called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. And when I updated it in 1997 to bring out a new edition of it, I realized that the opportunities that had existed in 1973 to insulate yourself from the government had in many cases disappeared by 1997 and it was far far harder in 1997 to be able to keep your income out of the hands of the government and to do other things and now I'm updating the book once again to make it available at libertyfree.com as an internet book that you can download and it's even worse than it was in 1997 so what's it going to be like 10 years or 15 years from now I would not sacrifice my life for this I want you to know that that's not in my philosophy to do things like that but I find this to be a very worthwhile way to spend my life and it's not as though it's a terrible grind I enjoy talking to people like you all right I'm kind of puzzled because I know that I care, and I can't figure out why. I mean, certainly you see these problems that are affecting all of us and that it's getting more difficult and that your effort makes a difference. But certainly if you spent the effort, rather than trying to cure the system systemically, but just on creating your own personal bubble, that would, even for you, your, your kids or grandkids, that would be far more effective, I would think. I can't disagree with you at all, and that's why I've said many times on this program that you should do something for yourself this week, and you should not let this societal situation depress you and get you down and make you uh, lethargic about just taking care of your own life, because that's where you do have far, far, far more control than you do in changing the political system. But I, if you want to do something about the political system, then allocate some time to it, allocate some resources to it, and be prepared to do it in a way by which it isn't all or nothing, so that that if you don't succeed, you have just wasted uh, a great part of your life. And when you say you don't know why you care, uh, why do you like a certain kind of woman? Why do you like certain kinds of movies? Why do you like a certain kind of music? Because that's who you are. <laughs> and it's not the same as even your brother, let alone the guy that lives across the street or the guy that lives on the other side of the country. It's just the way we are. We were built this way, and so we're satisfying our own natures by getting into this and doing the best we can. So you're saying we're, that, well, not generally, but you're, you and I may be, genetically built to care and that you see this just as maybe a game of chess or another challenge that has a side benefit of who knows it might even help yourself or other people it might very well if, if we succeed at this it will not just revolutionize the world but it'll revolutionize your life and so it's a long shot it's like having a chance to be in a lottery where the payoff is a million to one but the odds against you are only a thousand to one <laughs> If I, and, of course, I can't back that up yeah. in any way to, to, to prove it to you. Richard, thanks for bringing this up. I think you raised an important point. And well, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, we cut Richard off, I guess, did we? Well, let's go to Jeffrey in New Orleans, and my apologies to Richard. Jeffrey, are you with us? Yes, I have a late-breaking story from Geneva, Switzerland. At the 147-nation Doha Round Tariff World Trade Council Conference, the people agreed to a, a, a treaty uh, such saying that the United States will cut farm subsidies to corn farmers, rice farmers, cotton farmers, and sugar farmers in order that the African countries and Asian countries will cut their tariffs to send American industrial goods to the rest of the world. Europe is also involved in the cuts of its subsidies as well. The point is that, the, that this World Trade Organization-inspired conference is using government controls and government um, regimentation through subsidies and tariffs as tools in order to dictate who will farm what crops anywhere in the world, and they are disguising it and claiming that this is free trade by exchanging subsidy cuts for tariff cuts. And once again, we see the world government people doing their best to put American farmers out of business and put Americans, more Americans, on, on the unemployment line in order to satisfy their, their fetish for this World Trade Organization. Well, as you're pointing out, the idea is that they're offering something which is good on the surface, but in the process we're saying it's all right for the World Trade Organization to be making these decisions, and then the next decisions may not be so hot. It's the same as giving power to George Bush because you like him, not realizing that in next year or five years from now there may be somebody in office you hate, and he's going to have all that power that you gave to George Bush, and that people will be giving to the World Trade Organization now. But it comes back to what we were talking about in the last hour, that we are not going to be able to get people excited about the World Trade Organization, but if we get them excited about about freedom and the idea that government is not the answer to anything and that liberty is the answer to any any societal problem that you want to suggest, then they are automatically going to look askance and skeptically at any kind of international organization as long as they recognize that this is just another form of government. Well, the point is that this one is going to hurt American industry and farmers even more because it's, it's getting to the heart of the situation. Not that farm subsidies are right. They are not. Corporate welfare is principle wrong because it's government use of force to give you back money the government stole from you in the first place. Sure. 
And the whole point is that they're using this as a disguise for, for preparing 2,600 more pages of regulations saying which tax is going to be cut, which subsidy is going to be cut, and so on and so forth. The agreement was made when the U.S. backed down on, on um, protecting its subsidies to the, to the various farmers, and that's when the, and the Europeans had to do the same thing. But the point is that, the, that once again we're seeing world government using its tentacles to, to strip us of more and more of our, of our control over our lives and doing so while disguising it under the claim of getting rid of farm subsidies and replacing it with free trade. Well, as you point out, it's really free trade because there are 2,000 pages of regulations explaining it's free trade. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. I appreciate your call. And let's go now to Tennessee and talk with Howard. Good evening, Howard. I don't think we've heard from you before. Uh, how you doing? I'm just fine. Have we heard from you before? Yeah, it's been a while. Oh, I recognize your voice now. I didn't recognize your name. But I do recognize your state. <laughs> uh, so uh, you going, you're not going to be with Talk America? Is it what you're doing? Uh, I'm not going to be with Radio America after Radio tonight America. Oh, in, okay. in just another 45 minutes. Okay. But I'll be on another network, which will remain unnamed. But if you have a computer, just go to my website next week, harrybrown.org, and there will be full details on the show. It will begin two hours earlier than this one has been beginning. In other words, it will be 10 to 12 Eastern, 9 to 11 Central, 8 to 10 Mountain, and there I lose track after that. Okay. Uh, you talked about ending public schools mm-hmm. uh, uh, with uh, uh, an idea of shifting it into the private sector. Well, where's, the, where's the profit motive? Where's the profit motive in schools? No, where's the profit motive in, in uh, applying free market capitalistic uh, principles to uh, education or educating the, the, the populace, the masses here? Where's, where's the profit in it? Uh, the profit for for you and me, or for the schools, or no, for no, for, for businesses, for for anyone who wants to to get into that. that oh, well, it's kind of it's just like the computer industry. How do you spur competition under those conditions? Well, the, how do you spur competition under the food business or the computer business? Uh, the nice thing about the computer business is that we have companies like Microsoft and Apple, which started in people's garages, and uh, these became uh, very very successful because they were offering something that larger companies weren't. And the same thing would happen in the schooling business. You would have all different kinds of schools. You would have super saver schools that have no frills whatsoever and that make the least expensive possible school available uh, to those who can't afford anymore. And then on the other hand, you'd have schools that would be elite, that would uh, be training you for co- college preparatory, that would be training you for maybe special kinds of, of uh, uh, futures in college, like uh, going into medical school or something else, teaching you uh, anatomy and things of this sort back in the 8th or ninth or 10th grade or whatever it may be. You'd have all these different choices, and there would be room for so many different kinds of schools that uh, could make a profit at it, because people can make a profit when they have to satisfy the customers. But, but you're talking about investing. I'm, I'm talking about investing in people, not in computers, not in in TV sets or the latest video games. I'm talking about people. This is this is an entirely different. Uh, well, are you talking about the people who will teach? Not. I'm talking about people, children, uh, the, the whole nine yards from from uh, kindergarten through uh, grade twelve. I'm, I'm talking about. You, you're talking about investing in people. And if it was such a great idea, what you're what you're proposing was so well. I was I was basically uh, trying to get to the point of. Uh, Distinguishing between your notion of privatizing what or el- eliminating public schools and the traditional uh, privatization of, of, of certain schools, and, and they were racist, religious, economic, and sometimes uh, one and the same. And there was no profit motive involved. It's just that people felt that here's a better way to educate our children and not in the public school system because of changes within the law, because uh, uh, traditionally they they feel comfortable within their own uh, ethnic groups or, or uh, among uh, people of a similar religious uh, mindset. Well, I can't really speak for what the private schools were like as far as well, their admission have, admission policies 170 years well, ago. I'm talking about today. I mean, but, but I do. About tradition. I'm not but Howard, I do know this: that the racist schools that you're talking about, the segregated schools, were government schools, no, well, and, and no. the segregation was imposed by the government. And that's what happens when you turn these things over to the government. It's whoever has the most political influence, the most power, then imposes his way upon everybody else. Well, that's, that's not that's not true because what I'm saying is this year. Uh, and uh, I think it was May 17, 2004, 50 years ago, the Supreme Court ruled that segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. Right. Now, let me tell you something before you go on further. 20 years before that, no, pardon me, 10 years, 10 years, 10 years before that, Major League Baseball desegregated. 20 years before that, Major League Football desegregated. About five years before that, professional basketball desegregated. Desegregation has always come first in the private sector simply because of the profit motive. People who are in search of a profit do not indulge their prejudices even if they are racist, whereas people who are in government are free to indulge any prejudices they have and impose them upon other people by force. Well, first and foremost, when you, when you mention sports, you're not talking about doing it. It wasn't done because of uh, it was a great humanitarian move. That's what I just said. It was done because of the profit motive. And wouldn't you rather have somebody do something good? Uh, in, because of, they, wouldn't they, you rather have somebody do something good because of, of uh, the profit motive rather than having somebody do bad for humanitarian reasons? They weren't doing it because it was good. It was just, That's what I keep telling you. 
No, no, you're saying, no, it was doing something good for the profit motive. It wasn't for the profit motive. It's just to, to avoid a headache. They didn't want to hear from people. Here's, it's bad. Oh, no, 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 no. At the time that Major League Baseball desegregated, there was segregation in Washington, D.C. There was segregation in the halls of Congress. There was segregation everywhere. They didn't have to do that. Branch Rickey, who brought Jackie Robinson into the Dodger organization, did it because he recognized this phenomenal talent that he wanted to have on his team. And he was willing to put up with uh, a, a lot of guff from a lot of people who thought that it was wrong to mix the races in baseball because he was so determined that in the long run jackie robinson was going to do wonders for the brooklyn they dodgers did it because it was expedient they didn't do it because of profit motive because they were great humanitarians because they were vision they were visionaries they realized that this was going to be a public relations nightmare and they decided to jump in on and also because they knew that a lot of black athletes out there were just tremendous and they were tremendous players and they just wanted to jump in they didn't care anything about the, the all right howard let's suppose that if we got rid of all the government schools all the private schools would be racist are you black am i black yeah or are you white uh, no, I'm black. Okay. Or African American, or whatever they're calling it. All right. Let me ask you a question. Which would you prefer? That in a private school system, your children could only go to a black school because in your neck of the woods, there were no integrated schools whatsoever, and your child got a phenomenal education and really learned about history, geography, reading, writing, science, and mathematics. Or the other choice is he can go to the government school, get dumbed down, come out of the school, uh, graduate from high school, and just barely be able to read and not be able to do a lot of other things that he could have done in the segregated school. If that were the only choice, would you prefer that your child go to an integrated school and get a bad education? Well, first of all, uh, assuming that I, I, got, I did go to public school and that I, I, I had received a bad education is wrong, and, and the question is faulty, uh, just altogether. It's impossible for me to answer that question. Well, the reason I ask it is that you first have to decide what's most important to you, that your child get a good education or that he be able to mix with white people in the in the school system. But, but, I, mean, I would like to see him mix with white people. But, I would like to see white people mix with black people. But the point is that if we get all hung up on these social issues and then we sacrifice our children to it, that's what's happened. But, children but, get bust. Children uh, get, get involved in drug programs. Get, children get involved uh, pressuring their parents to recycle. Whatever happened to children getting an education, which should be the first and foremost response responsibility of schools, and if the schools were private and competing in the free market, they would have to provide the education or their parents would yank their children out of it. But, but what I was saying to you is this. Howard, we've run out, I'm sorry, we've run out of time again. This is a short segment. Uh, I think we've gotten your point and people have gotten my point too. Thanks so much for calling. I hope you tune in on the new show next week. Let's go to Oregon and talk with James. Good evening, James. Good evening, Eric. How are you tonight? I am just fine. What's on your mind? Um, well, I initially called uh, after uh, James from Alaska called in. Um, that was three weeks ago, wasn't it? <laughs> that was the beginning of the show. I know. Um, and I enjoyed the heck out of that debate. I thought it was it was excellent, even though it went 15 minutes. Um, at issue was uh, the the type of libertarian argument that is most effective, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and his his uh, his opinion was that uh, you shouldn't uh, leave out um, the uh, the fact of uh, one or more conspiracies if if in fact they are the case. Whereas your your opinion is that's only going to put the the person off. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting debate. However, uh, I don't really see it as a choice. It, it's more of a, or uh, actually, I do see it as, as a choice. It depends on who you're talking to. If the person you're talking to uh, is aware of, of conspiracies or is, say, conspiracy friendly to one degree or another, I don't see any harm in in giving him the history behind an issue's uh, or or one side of an issue's motivation, as it were. I mean, we're talking about awareness here. This is uh, awareness slash history. Um, uh, if if, for example. Uh, case in point, we're talking about, uh, you're talking about um, American education and, and the public school educational system. Well, it just so happens uh, there is a history behind the public educational system that, uh, I don't want to say it's conspiratorial, but a book has been written called The Underground History of American Education that gets into the history of who formed the public educational system as we know it today and mm -hmm. what their motives were. Um, now, I can understand from your point of view, being a representative of a political party, you don't want to be labeled as a conspiracy nut. So from your perspective, it's it's fine to stick to the arguments for a better life, as you, as you put it. Well, uh, it's, it isn't just that I don't want to be labeled a conspiracy nut. It is that people are not interested in learning about new problems. They've got enough problems already. What they want is to learn how to solve the problems that they already have. Why isn't my child getting a good education? Why don't I have, a, have enough money to pay my bills and pay off my debts and so on? It is only after people's minds have been opened to a particular subject and they have an interest in it that they have the slightest interest in knowing anything about how this problem came about in the first place. That's my point. And, and if you start off with how the problem came about in the first place, they're not listening to you. They may be standing there looking at you, but they're thinking about what they're going to do when they leave here and get in their car. Do, they, do I have time to stop at the laundry on the way home and still be home in time for dinner and so on? Uh, and uh, every once in a while nod to you to, to let you know that they're still there. But they're not hearing you. When, when you're talking about their lives and how much better their lives can 
can be, then they're interested. Not everybody's going to be interested, but most people are going to be interested, and they may agree with you as to the solution that you present, or they may not agree with you, but at least it's a subject that they want to talk about. Well, uh, there are problems with both methods. The problem, uh, I guess I'll pick your side first, the problem with your method is that you're, ta- you're basically trying to sell them on a promise, something they don't know about. They don't know what, what, how good it could be because they've never experienced it. Uh, right, uh, but even though they don't believe that there's any chance that this could come about, and maybe you're all wet about what would happen, at least it's a subject worth talking about to them. And this gives you the opportunity to compare the schools, for instance, with the supermarkets and the computer industry and so on. Why is it that all these other things work so well and the schools work so badly? Well, I think the reason is because the schools are run by government, and government doesn't have to compete. Government doesn't have to make a profit. Government doesn't have to answer to anybody, and these people can still stay in office. They, nobody pays any consequences for ruining your child's education, but people have real consequences consequences when your computer doesn't work and the food in the in the market uh, makes you sick and so forth and so on and people can understand this they again they may not agree with you and even if they do agree with you they may feel that this is a pipe dream that it the, the odds against it ever coming about are too great so what's the point but at least you're talking about it. at least you're interested now on the other hand you say did you know that the reason the public schools came about was because people were getting scared of irish people coming into the country and starting these catholic schools and they wanted to use the schools to socialize people and uh, they were scared to death that the catholic uh, schools would grow and spread and so they started uh, getting the government into the schools and so on and so forth yeah big deal who cares well, wait, wait a second you're, you're assuming that people aren't in- interested in history at all um, but well if, you, if you're just discussing it as history that's one thing but it doesn't lead to anything the schools still exist here and you still have to come back to the question of would it be better if we got rid of the government schools and it wouldn't matter what caused the government schools in the first place or how they came about they might be the greatest thing in the world even though they came about because of somebody's self-interested motive uh, and somebody's manipulating other people and somebody's secret agreement or whatever but if they're doing the job then fine keep them there who cares how they came about in the first place the question is do we want better education for our children and how do we get that and not uh, you know were these things uh, developed in the first place by ulterior motives? It's the same thing with the Federal Reserve System. But the, uh, first you have to convince them that there is something better, that something better can exist. That's, that's what we want to talk about. That's an enormous hurdle, though. If you well, but, but without that hurdle, you have nothing, well, because, well, because it doesn't really matter. And it, nothing else matters uh, except could my life be better? Could my children have better education if we got rid of the government schools? And if I'm not convinced of that, then I don't care how they came about. I don't care who's pulling the strings in Washington today. I don't care anything about it, because uh, it's not going to change my life for the better, so what do I care? But a study of history can reveal that things can be better. Like in 1840, we had a 93% literacy rate in this country. And now but, you're talking. Now well, you're talking, talking about, about it. history. No, now, but you're talking about it in the framework of how much better things could be than they are today. I mean, in just in the last 50 years, the literacy rate has dropped tremendously. If I had a better memory, I'd give you the exact figures, but uh, it was as, as high as, uh, was, was close to 90%. I think the time you're talking about, it was more like 96%, and it was still as high as 90% in the 40s, and then it dropped from there. Uh, incidentally, I, I will put on the website, on the radio links page tonight, I'm glad you brought that up, uh, James, because because that's a very good point. I'll put on the website an excellent history of um, the public schools by John Paul Gatto. I'll, I'll find the link and, and put it on there. Uh, I can get it to you. It's johntaylorgatto.com. Did I say John Paul Gatto? Yeah. I must have been thinking of John Paul Jones. That's, that's uh, the book I mentioned, The Underground History of American Education. Um, now, that's a good example of, of learning the history of the subject. And, um, but in order to understand how much better things could be, not to understand how somebody pulled a fast one, but to understand that it really is possible to have far, far better education than we have now. That's history in the service of selling benefits, uh, not selling problems. But history and awareness, uh, I, I don't really distinguish between, I mean, um, uh, first of all, I have to say that a lot of Amer- people in the world, especially Americans, have a, a distinct aversion to being manipulated. Um, if you can capitalize on that, I don't see any reason why you would dismiss the, the, uh, that very important... I mean, if you can make people aware that they are, in fact, being manipulated by a certain segment, I, I don't see the harm in, in, in pointing well, that out as an additional argument to, uh, say, uh, showing the benefits of changing that system. Well, I'd say one person out of a hundred will respond by actually taking action or getting involved as a result of knowing they've been manipulated. The rest of them will just say, uh, boy, that's terrible. Uh, that's politicians for you, or that's the big business for you, or that's, you know, that's white people for you, or whatever it is. Uh, but they're not going to, to get excited about doing something about it unless they think that this is really going to make a difference to their family. And even then, they may not. As you said, it's a hurdle to show this. Uh, and whatever uh, weapons that you are most comfortable using, pointing out how much better it used to be, uh, that's fine. That's anything that you can use that, that works for you, I'm all for but, uh, and, That's you know, right. if, you, if you think you can deal with conspiracies, even go ahead. But uh, you, you never get me to, to go down that road. I'm sorry. James, I'm going to uh, end this here because we're running out of time. But I really appreciate your uh, thoughts on this. And I hope you tune in uh, next week when I'm on that other network. And uh, stay with us and keep giving us your thoughts from time to time. Thank you very much. Let's quickly now go to Tennessee and talk with Phil. Good evening, Phil. Oh, how are you doing? I'm just fine. What's up? 
Okay, man, uh, you thought about how I have, I guess it's one question, but it's A and B part. Now, I understand where you was coming from, you know, like with Jackie Robinson and football and so forth. Now, the first thing I want to bring up is that uh, Coach, you know, Bell about Alabama, mm -hmm. passed away, and uh, Coach Eddie Robinson and Grambling had retired, and they were interviewing him. And he was speaking, they called it, of course, in your opinion on it. He said that he and Bell Brandt was talking all the time, although they weren't supposed to know Dave, but they were personal friends. People mm -hmm. know he was talking. And he said that uh, Martin Luther King is not really the one that brought in the grace in Alabama. Alabama played a team from the north, had a lot of black players, and they got stumped pretty bad. And so when he got back to Alabama, uh, Mayor Brandt called Eddie Robinson, how did we look? Did you see him? He said, yeah, we look bad. He said, okay. He said, I don't care what George Wallace is saying. I'm working again. I want to be some black players, too. And he met with George Wallace, and I didn't say what was said. But said he worked really against George Wallace. He said, Alan Grace will come to Alabama because he just wanted to win football games. At that time, Mayor Brandt was just as powerful as George Wallace. That's the A part of the question. Mm -hmm. Now, the B part is now I'm from the South. I'm in the pictures. I remember the days when you couldn't go to certain motels or even certain restaurants. But I, I run a small business myself, and I don't care what color my customer is, because all dollars are green. Sure. But, but at that time, you think it was peer pressure. The people didn't really, the white people didn't really feel that way in their heart. But they knew the community had to go back home to it at night. Or when they went to church on Sunday, it was peer pressure. That's my opinion. I just want your opinion. I'm going back to the 50s and 60s. Yes. Well, what we forget is that the reason there were segregation laws were because if there were not such laws, a lot of people would have desegregated their businesses. You only pass laws when you're trying to prevent people from doing what they want to do. And so if everybody in the South wanted to keep colored people out of their laundry uh, businesses, dry cleaners, uh, restaurants, and so forth, then there would have been no need for such laws. The laws were designed to enforce segregation. Once again, it's government that does it, and then the private sector gets blamed for it. And gee whiz, you know, if you privatize education, then you're going to go back to segregated schools and all this and that. No, it wasn't the private sector that was segregating the schools. It was the government, and okay. and it is, as you pointed out, the profit motive. Uh, Bear Bryant wanted to win games. Branch Rickey of the Brooklyn Dodgers wanted to win the World Series, and he saw Jackie Robinson as a, a valuable component in doing that. Well, you put out my question, but what I want to know, if you repeat again before you go off, I'll be able to find you next week since you won't be on the station I listen to you on. Mm -hmm. Well, if you'll go to my website, which is harrybrown.org, O-R-G, oh. and uh, right at the top of the homepage will be a uh, place that says radio, when you just click on that and you go to the radio page, and I will probably have up there by Tuesday all of the information on the show. Uh, I'm not sure what stations, specific stations will be on, but there will be a list of all of the stations on that network, and you can check. And if the station that you would ordinarily hear it on is listed there, but it's not carrying the show, you might want to call the station and ask them to carry it, because all the stations have been apprised of the fact that I'll be on that network, and if they know that there are people interested in hearing it, they probably will pick it up and start carrying it. But if it turns out that there is no station in your area, then just go to your computer and click on harrybrown.org, and right there will be a way for you to actually listen to it on the computer. All right, so well, nice talking to you tonight. Nice talking to you, Phil. Thanks so much for calling. Yes, sir. And I would like to emphasize what I have said tonight and said so often on this show, that you do have to think of yourself and your family first. You weren't put on this earth to save the country or to save the world. Uh, I really can't tell you why you were put on this earth, but I would say it's far, far more likely that you were put here to make the best of your own life, to do what is important for you and your family, to see to it that you live in the best way possible, that your children get the kind of upbringing you want, and that you enjoy your life while you're here. I hope that you will find it in your self-interest to help spread the ideas of liberty and to help show people how much better their lives could be if we got the government uh, reduced to begin with right down to its constitutional limits and then maybe keep going from there even. But very definitely get the government out of health care, education, get it out of running uh, the lives of people in other countries, uh, get it out of welfare, get it out of all of these programs that do not work, that do not produce the results promised for them when the bills are passed, that always cost far more than we're told they're going to cost at the beginning and never produce the results that we're told at the beginning that we're going to get from these programs. So there is so much that we have to tell people. There is such a better life that's available. And as I said and have said so often, we should be focusing on that because, as any salesman knows, it is the benefits that get people interested in the product. Once they're interested in the product, they may be more interested in the nuts and bolts, but they're not interested in the nuts and bolts until there's a reason to be interested in the nuts and bolts. And that's why I am so firmly of the opinion that we must be selling the benefits of liberty and not be selling so much the negative things that people may not be interested in. By definition, government is negative, and we have to point out the problems that exist with government, but we've got to be able to show that this is not something that needs to be reformed. This is not something that can be cured by getting better people in office. This is not something that can be cured by passing a better government program, but that liberty is the answer, that there is one important principle about the free market that should never be forgotten, and that is that whenever there's a problem, 
whether it is that people don't feel safe in the marketplace or people can't be sure that the product is going to produce the results promised for it or whatever the problem is, all this does is to create an incentive for someone to solve the problem in order to make a big profit. And the worse the problem is, the more people are going to be setting to work to try to fix it. But instead of just trying to gloss it over for political purposes, they have to produce in order to make money at it, or they're going to lose the money that they invest in trying to develop a workable solution to the problem. So whatever the problem is that you imagine that the free market might create, this just simply creates an incentive for somebody to solve it for you and make a, a big living at it. Thank you so much for listening to this show. Thank you, Radio America, for permitting me to be on this network and broadcast. I've certainly enjoyed it, and I hope you folks will join Join me next week on the new network, both on Saturday for the political show and Sunday for the money show. Whatever you do, I wish you the very best. Thank you, and good night.